Lord Jesus, thank you for Jay. Thank you for his, uh, his willingness to be here this morning to share with us what is on his heart from you as we center ourselves in Advent, in the, in the Sunday of joy. And so even as we sing quiet, reflective songs, deep within us is a sense of joy. And I pray that as we sit and listen to the words of you, O oh Lord, through your servant Jay, I pray that we would just be filled again with the joy of knowing you. Be with Jay, be with us as we receive your word. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks, Dean. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with you. It's nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. I think the last time I was here was a couple of years ago, and so uh, it's, it's nice to be back in a familiar place. <clears throat> well, today is the third Sunday of Advent, and Advent is marked out by the four Sundays before Christmas. And during the season of Advent, we wait to celebrate the already fulfilled promise of the Messiah. We also wait for what God has yet to complete. During Advent, Christians prepare themselves. We review our lives and we ready our hearts. We ask ourselves, what am I hoping for? What do I expect God to do in my life, in the world? And it's a time when we examine ourselves by asking, how can I make way for God to bring new life in me and bring new life through me? And so this Sunday we ask, how can I make way for God to bring joy in me and to bring joy through me? Now my hunch is that for many of us, life leaves us feeling overwhelmed, disoriented, discouraged. The holiday season can leave us feeling anything but joyful. Chances are you're wondering what it might look like for you to have a bit more Christmas cheer, and that's not just with a special drink you might like. Well, my sense is the story that we read of Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 offers some timely encouragement and instruction when it comes to joyful living. And so if you want to follow along, you can stick your finger in on Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25, and verses 57 to 80. And I'll be reading that story as we go along here this morning. I'm calling my story, my reflection this morning, Remember, O oh Joy. Today's story suggests that joy comes to us as we remember. Remember can have a couple of different meanings. Joy comes to us as we keep things in mind. Remember also can have the idea of bringing back together, of healing, of restoring shalom, which is a great Hebrew word meaning wholeness. So we experience joy as we bring back together, as we, exp as we heal, as we offer shalom to the world. But what would that look like? Well, let's find out, shall we? In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were the portrait of Jewish piety. Zechariah was a priest in the division of Abijah. Zachariah's wife, Elizabeth, was a descendant of the priest Aaron. These were righteous people. Not only that, they were righteous in the sight of God, obeying all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly as a sign of grateful devotion to God. So these folks are the epitome of purity. People who have it all together. They're models of how others are to live. But there's a tension. They were childless because Elizabeth could never conceive. And now they were quite old, like 65. Okay, I thought that was funnier, but whatever. <laughs> How many of us are like that? Feeling a bit barren. We've maybe tithed regularly, worshipped frequently, served on the church committees gone out of our way to treat others kindly, and stuff still goes sideways. Broken relationships with family members, illness, disability, conflict in the church. The economy goes sideways and suddenly your finances are spinning down the drain. Yep, tension. 
couple that has it all together but experiencing difficulty. It so happened that Zachariah's division was working their assigned shift, and he was carrying out his priestly duties before God. According to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot, kind of a draw, for his once-in-a-life turn to burn incense on the altar. So we find Zachariah just doing his job. Could it be that our regular jobs at home, at work, at school, in the church, on the parents' committee at, in, the local, in the local elementary school? Could it be that those are the places, the context for extraordinary visions? I wonder. Turns out that Zachariah's work leads to this once-in-a-lifetime encounter. At the appointed hour, while the congregation gather, is gathered outside praying, Zechariah goes into the temple of the Lord to make an incense offering. As he's pouring incense on the flame, there's smoke billowing, and all of a sudden, a figure appears to the right of the altar. And when Zechariah sees this figure, he's startled, shocked. The text says he's gripped with fear. I find this funny. Zechariah is a priest in the temple the place where God meets the Hebrew people. And Zechariah is offering incense. This is a task that brings him as close to the presence of God as any person other than the high priest might ever come. This is one step removed from the holy place, and very few people get there. All signs are flashing. Expect to meet God. Expect to meet God. Expect to meet God. And Zechariah isn't. Some priest. Could it be that we don't see God because we don't go into our days looking for God? But the angel reassures him, don't be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son by you. Now hang on a sec. Your prayer has been answered. For who? For who has Zechariah been praying for? Has he been praying for himself? So are we talking about personal prayers here? Or has Zechariah been praying for his people who are longing for a Messiah? Are these public prayers that the angel's referring to? It's not entirely clear. But Zechariah's prayers have been answered. Personal prayer for public benefit. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son by you, the angel says. You're to name him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll drink neither wine nor beer. Rather, he'll be filled with a greater spirit. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb and will turn many sons and daughters of Israel back to their God. He will go ahead of the Lord in style and strength of Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to children, and the disobedient to the good sense of the righteous, making ready a people prepared for the Lord. God's favor on Zechariah and Elizabeth anticipates God's favor on Israel. There is a personal gifting that benefits the public. This blessing of the Spirit on Zechariah and Elizabeth is for the blessing of the nations and the generations. The father turning to the, turning to the child isn't just Zechariah turning to his son. This is a global renewal. Sons and daughters returning to their father God. And there's a sense of local renewal. Fathers turning their hearts to their children, treating their children gently. And so in this small personal situation that involves Zachariah and Elizabeth, God's doing something big with cosmic dimensions. Hard to believe, isn't it? Well, yeah. In fact, Zachariah asked the angels, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. I like that. I'm old, but my wife's well along 
Smart man. How can I be sure of this? Is this skepticism? Like, how can I be sure of this? Or is it a surprise? Like, (laughs) how can I be sure of this? Like, this is too good to be true. It's not entirely clear. Look here, replies the angel. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Now listen. You will be silent. You won't be able to speak until the day when it all happens because you didn't believe my words. But they will be fulfilled at the proper time. Is this a punishment? Requests for signs are viewed negatively in Luke. But I wonder if this is more gift than punishment. For one thing, it keeps Zechariah from saying more dumb things. But it's a sign. He asks for proof and he gets it. How many times have you prayed and asked for signs and gotten gotten proof? You won't be able to say anything or hear anything until my saying comes true. This is a guarantee, certification, by this direct, constant witness that will be with you until the baby is born, you can be sure God's promises come true. Severe mercy, maybe? When his time of his priestly assignment was complete, Zechariah went home. Soon after that, Elizabeth conceived And for five months, she remained in seclusion, relishing her pregnancy. You can just hear her going, oh, joy. This is the Lord's doing, she said. At last, the Lord has shown favor and taken away my public shame. Note Elizabeth's simple acceptance. I believe. And she savors her joy in private. Yes, at last. A little bit different from Zachariah. How can I be sure about this? I'm curious as to how Zachariah communicated what happened to Elizabeth. How do you talk about angels when you can't say anything? And yet Zachariah had enough faith to get Elizabeth pregnant. Oh, joy! I thought that was funnier too. (laughs) Like, think about this. I have a hard enough time wooing my wife, Andrea, with all of my abilities available to me, let alone being mute and deaf. The first time I asked Andrea out, the best I could come up with was, I want to go see some improv, but all of my friends are busy. Want to (laughs) go? It took me a half hour to come up with that. I'm still amazed she said yes. Back to Zachariah. You get the sense there's some giggling going on, don't you? The writer's smiling, Elizabeth's smiling. Oh, joy. Here's something that I find interesting. This story says something about our sexuality. Note how Elizabeth felt shame even though she was righteous in the sight of God. What this story suggests is that Elizabeth's sexuality, her barrenness, does not define her. Our sexuality doesn't define us in a comprehensive way either. This is different from what our culture tells us. Culture tells us that sex is about personal expression or personal fulfillment. For many, it's the only thing that defines our identities. But this story suggests an alternative perspective. I even suggest a more joyful view. Note how sex has a kingdom purpose. Zachariah and Elizabeth come together to conceive John. His birth is about taking away public shame. John will call people to repentance. That's about taking away public shame. In this story and in our stories, sexual behavior has an impact on others. Sex is a public act. Something about the kingdom of God defines our sexual identities and our sexual activities. Hey, we're talking about joy. We might as well be talking about sex, right? 
So here you are. You can't talk, you can't hear, and you have nine months. You're all alone with your thoughts. No TV, no newspaper, no internet, no cell phone. What would you think about all day, every day for nine months? Maybe in those nine months, you remember the disparity between a life of faithfulness and unrealized goals and dreams. Missed opportunities, mistakes, regrets, disappointments, unanswered prayers. You didn't realize that the voice in your head was actually Jay Jansen's voice. Maybe in those nine months you start to reflect on your work. As a parent, you have to raise a child. As a spouse, how are you going to communicate? As a neighbor, as a priest, how are you going to do your job with a disability now? You can't talk, you can't hear. Don't be afraid. Yeah, right. Maybe as the weeks stretch on, you start to remember how God has delivered on the covenantal promises. Elizabeth is actually pregnant. Oh, joy. There have been bitter mercies that have turned sweet in time. Oh, joy. You begin naming all of the good things that happened to you this week. You start listing all of your answered prayers. Oh, joy. Oh, joy. You jot down the mercy that you've experienced from others. You savor the feelings that you had when you realized that a prayer had been answered. few months in, you've realized that your relationships have changed. Maybe you begin to remember how God has shaped and defined you in a community. You're a brother, sister, son, 
daughter, mother, father, by virtue of your family, your work makes you a doctor, a teacher, counselor, business person, farmer, accountant, contractor, driver, retiree, volunteer. In the congregation, you're a musician, a pastor, an elder, a greeter, an encourager, an evangelist, an apostle, a prophet, a caregiver, a prayer. All sorts of gifts arrive as a result of this community. Oh, joy. In the silence, you dream old dreams, you dream new dreams. How will, you, how will your child participate in the work of God's coming kingdom? You begin to dream of ways you might be a better priest at home, in the congregation, in the neighborhood, on the job. And the time comes, and the community is gathered, and the next thing you know, people are motioning to you, and somehow you decipher in the gestures that the community is asking you, what are you going to name your son? And you write on a tablet, his name is John, and oh joy, sound explodes on you. Everyone's astonished, and what's even better is praise is pouring out of your mouth, Zachariah's mouth is now open, his tongue is loose, and he's talking, praising God. And an awe-filled fear spread throughout the neighborhood, and the whole affair was talked about through the hill country of Judea. Everyone who heard about it took it to heart, wondering, what will become of this child? Clearly, the, Lord is, the Lord's hand is with him. Notice how the congregation, the community is the place where revelations are given and received. Those are gifts. Notice how the congregation becomes a place of sacrifice that leads to cleansing. A personal experience benefits the community once more. And what is Zechariah crying out? Zechariah's name means God remembered, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. The prophecy he speaks was filled with God's remembrances. Blessed be the Lord, Israel's God. He has come to his people and brought them their freedom. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. You can just see him dancing, can't you? Just as he proclaimed through the mouths of the prophets, the Holy One speaking from ancient times, there would be salvation from our enemies, deliverance from hatred. The Lord has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and kept his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies so we might worship the Lord, holy and righteous before his face to the end of our days. Oh, joy, can I get an amen? Zachariah is like most of us, slow to believe, struggling with our muted, stunted responses to the grace of God. But the joy here is that God regularly works through ordinary people, doing what they normally do, who with a mixture of half faith and devotion are holding themselves ready for whatever God has in mind. Slowly but surely, Zechariah does get to a place of obedience. Think about it. He could have grown resentful over those nine months, he could have said, no way I'm naming my kid John. 
But when he gives his son the name John, meaning God is gracious, Zechariah is unsilenced and from his lips pour praises that extol God's great grace upon him and all of Israel. Elizabeth and Zechariah take different paths to faithfulness, one immediate, one slower and harder, but they end up in a similar place, both filled with the Spirit, caught up in gratitude to God, and, oh joy, surrendered to what God is doing. What makes Zechariah's prophecy particularly compelling is that Zechariah isn't concerned about himself or his miraculous son. Look closely. Zechariah's dreams for baby John don't get in the way of God's dreams for John. Now, that's remarkable. Some of us parents, our dreams get in the way of what God might want to do in the lives of our children. One time, my mom came up to me and said, Jay, if you go into pastoral work, that's okay. I bless you. And my response was, okay. I wasn't thinking of becoming a pastor. Like, where's this coming from? My mom grew up as a pastor's kid. She said, for years I was afraid that my kids would go into pastoral work. Her dreams were getting in the way. And she said, if this is something God is calling you to do, then I'm okay with it. I want to bless you into this. I, sh- I just sort of shrugged and said, okay, fine. And lo and behold, I'm ending nine years of pastoral work at the end of this month. Like God... Zachariah gives up his son for the sake of his people and for you and for me. Instead of getting in the way, Zachariah's prophecy exalts God, points to the dominant work of the day spring, and foretells God's tender mercies on upcoming generations of God's covenant people. He stands in wonder that he is part of God's grand work of bringing peace on earth as it is in heaven. He, with all of his weakness and his dullness, basks now in the love and the forgiveness and the mercy of God. Oh, joy! And then Zechariah blesses the son that God has given him to Elizabeth, to Israel, to us. Zechariah commissions his son. You can just see Zechariah holding this little baby. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare a way for him, presenting the offer of salvation to his people, the forgiveness of all their sins. The heart of our God is full of mercy. That's why the day spring from on high has come to us, shining on those living in darkness, giving light to them who sit in the shadow of death, guiding our feet into the way of peace. Pray that over your kids, over your grandkids. All of this is happening in the days of King Herod. Days filled with corruption, oppression. In the days of Trump, I mean Herod. It's difficult to believe that promises are being fulfilled. It's difficult to believe that a new age is dawning. It's difficult to see the Prince of Peace's reign on earth as it is in heaven. It's easy to be afraid. It's easy to fear that the divine visitation was just an illusion. It's easy to fear that the exodus you've experienced is only a temporary reprieve. It's easy to fear that the new covenant is nothing more than a scam. It's easy to worry that your child will suffer and die if she or he confronts people with the call to repentance. Jesus himself told us that if we want to follow him, we must take up our cross daily and that our ministry will be as sheep among wolves. Not exactly comforting descriptions. But in the end, oh joy, Zachariah is transformed. Zachariah's barren imagination has been redeemed. He's remembered the long, long history of God's steadfast loving kindness and how that has overwhelmed any and all obstacles in its path. Zachariah is sure of this. And Zechariah's work has been redeemed. His half-hearted prayers for himself and for his people have been answered in a bawling baby. Oh, joy. And diapers. Getting on the floor and stepping on Lego. 
Zachariah's and Elizabeth's old age has been redeemed. They're ready to be prophets of the Most High God. Sorry, parents of a prophet of the Most High God. They're going to be pushing hard to the finish line. This reminds me of uh, Caleb and Joshua chapter 14. As Israel's moving into the promised land, Caleb shows up and says to Joshua, Hey, Joshua, remember me? 45 years ago, we were working together. We went and spied out the promised land. I'm 85 now, and I'm just as strong as I was then. Imagine Arthur Block doing this. Give me hill country. And so Joshua sends Caleb into hill country where giants live, and we're told that Caleb goes and kicks giant butt. Now, if you ask me, Elizabeth and Zachariah have a harder job. They're going to be parents. Crazier yet, Zachariah and Elizabeth are themselves going to be prophets. Their obedience has been preparing a way for the Lord. Their words have been presenting salvation to the people around them. It leaves the neighborhood and the hill country saying, what's going on here? Zachariah and Elizabeth are guiding people's feet into the way of joyful peace. Give me hill country. Man, I hope that when I'm old at 65, I'm still pushing hard. As deeply and profoundly joyful as Elizabeth and Zachariah end up. As Zachariah and Elizabeth have been remembered, as they've been made more whole, we see the community around them being blessed. Zachariah and Elizabeth's joy and peace, their wholeness, their shalom leads to joy and peace for others. And the same can be said of us. God is looking to birth new things in you and through you. Maybe it's a joy that comes with hope. This week, remember all of the good things that are in your life. Write them down on a list. I dare you to try and keep it to five pages. Limit your joy to five pages. I dare you. Maybe it's a joy that comes through repentance. Write down one thing this week that burdens you. Maybe it's something you don't like about yourself. Then find a quiet spot. Light a candle. Burn some incense. And ask God how maybe you should rethink that aspect of life. That's what repentance is, rethinking. It's a remembering. And see how God remembers you, puts you together in a new way. Perhaps it's a joy that comes with obedience. This week, get a dry erase marker or a sticky note and put on your mirror something like, open my eyes to see you today in my work, God. Or maybe write, how can I guide people into joy in my school, in my neighborhood, in that committee that I don't like working on? Or better yet, how can I bless the congregation of Fraser View? There are things that need to be blessed here, people that need to be blessed here. I know that you folks have been on a bit of a journey the last couple of years. You have staff that are tired, stressed. You have a budget that needs to be met. Who knows? But once an idea comes to mind, act on it. Go and remember someone or something. In this season of Advent, we are called to anticipate to prepare. On this Sunday, we are called to make way for the coming Prince of Peace. Oh, joy. Amen. Let's join Elizabeth and Zachariah. Let's remember with them. Here's what I'm going to do in a few moments. I'm going to invite you to do that to one another. I'm going to invite you to turn to someone and say the words of Zechariah over someone next to you. And I've got them on the, on, on the screen there. But I'm going to pray these words over you right now. Zechariah's joyful words. Remember, the heart of our God is full of mercy. That's why the day spring from on high has come to you, shining on you, giving light to you, guiding your feet into the way of peace. You, child, people of Fraserview, are a prophet of the Most High.
go before the Lord to prepare a way for him, presenting the offer of salvation to his people, the forgiveness of all their sins. O oh, joy. Amen. Uh, as Dean and, and the team come up to sing their song, I invite you to just turn to someone, put your hands on their shoulders maybe, and say these words, or say something good to one another. I don't care. Just say, I love you, or whatever. But there are some words. Pray them over you. Take a few moments to do that.